we have an opportunity. We have, we have an opportunity to fix a lot of what's gone wrong in terms of uh, the way we pay our folks. And uh, it, it is truly an opportunity. But having said all that, I'm going to say this as well. Uh, some of this isn't going to be easy, and I share this with staff. Some of this will be difficult. Some of these things you're going to look at and you're going to think, wow, that, that, that isn't necessarily comfortable with me. Um, but I want you to just keep in mind, um, from my, my humble vantage point, we, we, we do have an emergency. And so uh, I'll go from there. Uh, the superintendent's proposed budget is there, there is the uh, agenda. I wanted to highlight Roman numeral five. Because part of what I'm presenting tonight doesn't really have a lot to do or very little to do with, with dollars, with revenues. It has more to do with valuing our people and valuing our people in other ways that doesn't involve money, but money obviously talks, it's, imp it's important. Um, you've probably seen statistics recently. Uh, Ms. Sloan and I uh, put together an editorial where, uh, you know, according to uh, Jay Lark's study from 2015, when you factor in our local economy and our region, we actually rank 127 out of 132 in terms of teacher salaries. Now that's old data, but it hasn't improved much in the last four years, so I suspect it may have even gotten worse in the last four years. But we do have an emergency situation. Um, my budget presentation has a lot to do with revenues and, and salaries, of course, but there is a piece that has to do with things that really don't cost money or cost very little money. There's me. I'll just let you know, let that settle in for a second. <laughs> okay, that's enough. Uh, so the, the overview, uh, as, you know, as you're aware, my, my responsibility as your superintendent is to present a needs-based budget. I believe that's, that's what I've done. You're going to see throughout this presentation that the need, the primary need, has to do with uh, dealing with the compression issue, especially related to teachers. But I do believe it is a needs-based budget. Um, I, I will say, I will confess to you that uh, there have been years in the past where I haven't presented a needs-based budget. You're, you're familiar with the term uh, just get by budget, and I, I'm guilty of presenting those in a, a, year, a few years back because the revenue picture was so poor and our state revenue money was so bad, and the governor's budget actually is a glimmer of hope and a, a, in, in a 11 years as a superintendent, with it, which I've not seen especially in the middle of a buy and budget. Uh, so midway through these 20 presentations to staff, um, we got the governor's proposed budget. So the last several presentations were a lot easier than the first several presentations because we got good news from the state. And as I've had to explain to many teacher groups, you don't decide how much money is allocated to the schools. You only make a proposal to the, to the board of supervisors. They decide how much money is allocated to schools. They make decisions about setting local tax rates, et cetera, et cetera. There's still a misconception out there, believe it or not, amongst folks that you and I decide how much teachers and custodians and food nutrition and bus drivers make and how much money goes to the schools. We don't, you don't have taxing authority. Uh, that's up to the Board of Supervisors. Uh, the, at the November 3rd retreat, now this is important in that uh, each year at our retreat, we talk about, or the school board talks about its goals what it values, what's most important, uh, what they would like to see uh, emphasized through the budget proposals, what came through loud and clear during the November 3rd uh, retreat was an emphasis on dealing with the compression issue within uh, pay scales and making that a top priority. School safety is always the number one priority. Uh, we, we take that for granted, I think. Maybe we shouldn't, but we do in terms of the way we budget. Uh, but teacher, uh, uh, especially teacher salary, uh, was a top priority coming out of that retreat on November 3rd. Um, as you know, we're in the middle of a binding and budget, so um, I'll be talking about this in a, in a little bit. We already have been told from the county how much money, additional money, we'll be receiving in the second year of the biennium. I'll get to that in just a minute. Uh, and the school board improved the compensation study that we heard from earlier from the good folks at VAS. Uh, VAS folks have done a lot of these, and. Bonnie and Janet echoed what I've been hearing, which is that there are many school divisions that are doing the same thing we're doing because many school divisions are compressed and many school divisions stopped doing COLAs and automatic step increases 10 or so years ago when the recession hit and now they find themselves in the same place that we are. 
Uh, this is a little bit of an overview relative to the calendar. I won't spend much time on this because this is something you've probably already seen before, but it kind of gives you an idea of where we are. Um, you can see one, two, three, four, five over. That's where we are in presenting my budget. The next step in this process is for the school board to have a hearing. Um, next step, step in the budget process is for the school board to have a budget hearing. Uh, and I, I don't know the day off the top of my head. Is it the 20, 25th? 25th. Okay, so the, the budget hearing will be on the 25th. Uh, once this presentation is done, um, it really is the school board's budget. I make my presentation, it becomes the school board budget. They get input, obviously, and it's important that folks come to the hearing and share their thoughts and opinions relative to the, the proposed superintendent's budget. Because at that, at that point, it's their budget. And then later on, it becomes the board of supervisors' budget. That's sort of how the process, not sort of, that is how the process works. So that will occur sometime end of February where we submit our the school board's approved budget to the Board of Supervisors. Uh, the piece about getting input from various stakeholders and guidance from the school board, the guidance from the school board came on November 3rd. The uh, input from stakeholders really had to do with the VAS study. That's really where the feedback was received, was through the VAS study. In the past, we have done surveying and we have uh, sought directors and principals to provide us with their, their budget requests. But honestly, I told my principals, um, you know, this fall, you know, ex nay on the budget request A is because the money, if there is additional funding, it's going to go towards uh, the salary issue. So there weren't a lot of requests for equipment, uh, technology, et cetera, et cetera. We did purchase over 900 Chromebooks, but we purchased that with end of the year money. Uh, an overview, there's a, a good sort of, not actually a Venn diagram, kind of a Venn diagram. Uh, but it's the school board's goals on the left-hand side, and then the input that we receive from staff relative to a little bit of everything. And then I use those two factors to develop my proposed budget. But as you're gonna find out, most of what's in my proposed budget is in the left-hand <coughs> column um, having to do with um, uh, equity and access namely salaries. Uh, we already talked about that. Okay, a little bit about our school division and accomplishments, just as a reminder. And this is an important slide, and I'm gonna tell you, it has to do with the green uh, font there. So just a, a 35,000 foot overview of our accomplishments. All of our schools are fully accredited. Uh, equity and inclusion have been our focus for the last few years. Um, academics, academies-wise, we are ready in fall of 2019 to open the year with three, uh, ac uh, three academies, one at each of the three high schools. Uh, we have expanded our CT offerings. You got a little glimpse of it tonight with the, um, with the expansion of the culinary labs, but we have others. Um, the diesel program, at, I believe at Liberty High School, the, the ENT program, I'm sure I'm missing some others, but, but we have seen expansion of CT, which is a really positive thing. Uh, community engagement, uh, Bob the Bus has been wildly, wildly successful, as has the Flash Grub uh, program and the Graham Bland Center, which opened in Marshall. Uh, we've trained over 400 staff in youth mental health first aid. We're entering in a, into an ESCO project that will uh, enable us to complete over $11 million worth of uh, 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 capital projects, um, mostly having to do with energy and the conservation of energy. Uh, the SSO, SR program, officers program, has been extremely successful. We've hired great people uh, for, in both areas, but um, we've, we've added a lot of SSOs, even in competition with other school divisions, because lots of folks are hiring SSOs. But we've been very fortunate. Bus safety, uh, building safety. Um, I, I wanted to point out the reason I had Prashant highlight these in different font. The, the things in green are either all grant funded or mostly grant, or all grant funded or mostly grant funded. And I wanted to point that out, I think that's important. The one purple font, which is entryway, we're working on collecting grant money to re redesign our entryways so that they're safer, okay? But the green font, those are things that we're paying for mostly through grants. And that's important because we have go-getters out there who are applying for and receiving grant funding. We're able to do so much through grant money that has nothing to do with the county. We're just out there getting it. And that's, that's awesome. 
because that doesn't happen in a lot of places. We now have a grant writer, Stacy Griffin, who I think is here. Wave, Stacy, because she's amazing. She and Kristen McCullough are going to set the world on fire in terms of collecting additional grant money for the school division. Uh, we have a 96%, 96.1% graduation rate, which is great, but what's really great are those three bullets right underneath it. Um, we exceed the state rate. We've, our graduation rate for black students is 95.5%, and the graduation rate for students with disabilities is 95%. Those are, un, those are remarkable statistics, truly remarkable statistics. Okay, uh, key indicators as far as local composite index, just as a reminder, and this is not necessarily a happy thought, uh, our local composite index is now higher than Loudoun County's and Prince William County. It's uh, 0.6114, I believe. I can't really see that. But you can see it's trending up. Um, you can see that our average daily membership is relatively flat. And you can also see those indicators at the very bottom are all trending up. Okay, so translation, the state views Fauquier County as a, as a wealthy community. Uh, that's just their view. Um, the trend indicators are that we're going to continue to be viewed as a wealthy community, probably going to continue to be viewed as a wealthier community because all of our trend indicators are going up. And when our average daily membership stays about the same, or, or actually our, our, our countywide uh, population stays roughly the same, that hurts us in the local composite index because they look at it, there's fewer people to educate, etc but all those other indicators are going up. So I expect our composite index to go up again. Uh, this is, okay, this is the, um, the uh, get your pencil ready, uh, uh, Cassandra and Karen. Uh, so we have a couple of hot spots that are gonna require us to have a pretty serious conversation about the R word, which is redistricting. Uh, we do, the, you can see the, bulleted schools on the right hand side there, those are the schools where we've got our eye on as, as far as being uh, near the 100% capacity mark. But we don't see this as a crisis necessarily because we have other schools within proximity that are much lower than you know 90 or even 80%. Uh, so that's gonna require at, at some point for us to look at redistricting some of those schools. My recommendation would be that we not do that until we iron out what's going on with the middle schools so we can pull the band-aid off at one time. Uh, so we'll, we'll, our recommendation is going to be, let's see what happens with middle school, and then perhaps we do the whole, whole redistricting enchilada at once with middle school, high, and elementary. But it, it is going to happen. Revenue summaries, all right, this is where we get into a lot of numbers, but uh, honestly, I'm gonna be focusing on the numbers at the bottom and to the right. All right, so this is a, a, a snapshot of our revenue picture. Um, if you look, if you, I'll just pick out some random numbers here that are, are of most importance, okay? Um, if you look at the state revenue piece, so we did receive in the governor's budget, we haven't received anything yet, but potentially are going to receive upwards of $2.7 million um, if the governor's budget is approved in total, but it, it won't be, of course, because we are we are in crossover right now. So um, neither one of the, the, neither the state nor the Senate budget's proposals are drastic in terms of what they do for the governor's budget, but they will influence the governor's budget. One's better than the other. Uh, I think uh, this, the, House of Delegates budget is a little better than the Senate budget um, because it, pu it puts more money into uh, lottery funds, so it's, it's money that you could use wherever you want, so we would use it towards salary. But the, the total is $2.7 million. Of the $2.7 million in the governor's budget, a big chunk of that is restricted money, so it has to be used for certain things, like they changed the SOQ levels for guidance counselors, so we, would have, we must hire a Guidance, some guidance counselors, and some of that money will go go towards special ed. So there, there's other areas where the money is earmarked for certain things, but about 1.8 million of that money can be used for non-discretionary, and in our, in my recommendation, will go towards salary. So that's the that's the state picture. Uh, the federal picture is always not much, a whole lot shaken there with the federal dollars. Uh, there's a little bit of an increase. 
um, but not but not much. And then the local revenue piece. So this is the local revenue request, and this is this is going to require the most explanation. So if you look in the bottom right hand column there, currently in the second year of the local biennium budget, there's 2.17 million additional dollars for Fauquier County Public Schools. Okay, in addition to that, there's $440,000 for school security officers. Now, even though we haven't hired all the security officers yet, that money is going to be transferred over once they are all hired, and that'll become, they'll become our positions, and that'll become money that's in our budget, okay? The last piece is my request for additional um, mid-biennium money, and that is the, to the tune of $2.36 million. So the, the magic question is, how much are you going to be asking uh, the Board of Supervisors for and the superintendent's uh, proposed budget? It's $2.36 million. Okay. Now, scales wise, um, we we looked we have looked carefully at Bass's numbers. Um, we've looked at the state money. We've looked at uh, the areas that we can uh, delve into within our own budget and. We decided that we want to be more aggressive than what's presented in the VAS study, okay? So if you look, it's a little bit hard to see, but we, we feel, again, like this is an opportunity. This is an opportunity to fix a problem, or mostly fix a problem, to the tune of 93 uh, to 90 to 100% of uh, market competitiveness, all right? So the result, in my proposal will be pay, teacher pay increases anywhere between 2% and 15%. Rather than show you all the different scales, we gave you a sample scale right here. And this is where you all might want to take pictures. Um, so the sample scale there is just an example of folks in different parts of our pay scale, whether they have a bachelor's, a master's, a bachelor's plus 15, a master's plus 30, et cetera, what their, what their step is, what their current salary is, and then what their proposed salary might be. And you can see in the far right hand column, it's anywhere between 15% being the highest increase at, for someone at master's plus 30 at year 17, down to 3.7% for a bachelor's teacher at year two uh, with only a bachelor's degree. Now, Again, this, this requires a little bit of explanation. So in order for us to have access to the money that's in the governor's proposed budget, we have to guarantee a 5% raise over the biennium. And this is a, one of those clarification points. It's not 5% next year. It's 5% over the two-year biennium. So the requirement on our end is, since we gave a 3% raise this year, the requirement is we give at least a 2% raise next year, that gives us the 5% raise that the governor's budget talks about. In order for us to have access to that money, everyone in the school division needs to get at least a 2% raise. So what I'm presenting, all these numbers I'm giving you are 2% raise plus some kind of market adjustment, okay? So in other words, if that person at the top that's getting 15%, that person's getting a 2% raise plus a 13% market adjustment, and so on down the list. Okay, the biggest surprise that came out, someone asked me this recently, was the biggest surprise that came out of the VAST study. So the biggest surprise that came out was how compressed um, building administration is. They're badly compressed. So if you go down through this list, you'll see the cost of decompressing the different folks on the, uh, on the scale here. We have teachers, Licensed professionals, that includes psychologists, speech language pathologists, and I don't want to forget some of these folks. Uh, but th those folks that t we have a really hard time filling, for, for the most part. Uh, so that would, there would be a, an adjustment for them. Nurses, we were I'm proposing that we move, move nurses to the bachelor scale. So in other words, moving them to the teacher scale. Uh, that's expensive, but I think that's something that we need to do. Uh, instructional assistants, we treated instructional assistants like we, we were treating teachers. We looked at them in terms of how they're compressed, how much it will cost to decompress them, and to get them to that 93 to 100% uh, scale. 
principals and assistant principals. Okay, this is the one area where you'll see administrators pop up. So for principals and assistant principals, I'm recommending a 2% increase for them, which is required, and then a market adjustment for that group. So all told, we're looking at a um, little north of $8 million. Okay, this scale, this is where I get to use my uh, laser pointer. So, the blue scale here, and I'm, again, we're only giving you two scales to look at. We're giving you the bachelor's scale and the master's scale. There's other scales. There's bachelor's plus 15, et cetera, et cetera. But I'm just going to show you two. So right now, the bachelor's scale, for example, the blue line represents the market. Okay, Vast earlier told you what the market was, right? It's all those school divisions that sort of surround us plus Albemarle. Um, that's the blue line. The green line is where we are right now, the bottom line. Okay? The red line is the 90% that Vast is recommending. This line right here is what I'm recommending. Okay, so I'm recommending that we're getting a little bit closer to 100% on both scales, at all scales really. Down here where they're right next to each other means they're already at 95%. Okay? With, uh, with even even at the 90, this kind of, kind of sounds convoluted. But even at the 90 percent, when you add that money, they're really they're already at 90, 95 percent. It's the other folks at the end of the scale that are really getting shafted. It's kind of confusing, I know, but that's that's what I'm proposing as we get to that gray line right there. Non-traditional compensation. These are these are things that are going to, going to require, um, in some cases. Um, policy updates, policy changes. One thing I'd like to do is change the family uh, sick leave bank, uh, increase it to 55 days uh, to allow uh, employees to take sick leave for spouse, child, or parent. And then anything beyond 55 days for additional paid or unpaid leave is at the discretion of the superintendent. Hey, time off. What I would like to do is rather than have 10 days sick leave, which all full-time folks receive, plus three days personal leave, I like to make it just 13 days leave uh, so folks will have access to um, 13 days of paid leave. Uh, it could be sick, it could be personal, it doesn't matter. We just want to, we want to just call it leave. Uh, loyalty appreciation, rather than doing uh, the, the pens, which are beautiful, uh, but w we would rather hand folks checks. And so I'm budgeting $200,000 to uh, at the offset to re award folks for their loyalty to our school division. Because uh, we, as we tell them, we know they have choices. And um, it, would, it would be really nice to award those folks loyalty with, with, some, with some money. Uh, other benefits. Uh, this, is, this is a biggie and this is expensive, but again, it's something I think we need to do. I won't read the slide to you, but I'll just tell you, we, we want to, or I want to propose, or am proposing, that we provide a health insurance credit, the same as what the county does, which is a $500 a month credit for folks who have 20 more years of consecutive service and have, have participated in uh, our health insurance plan for at least five years immediately preceding retirement, are eligible for retirement from VRS. Now that can be um, uh, reduced benefit VRS as well. We have plenty of teachers in the school division or second career people who maybe will teach for 20 years and are ready to retire. They're not eligible for the full VRS benefit, but they're gonna be, they would be eligible for our full $500 a month credit, okay? That's, a little, that's the only difference between what we're doing and what the county is currently doing. So it's a combined quality, combined benefit of $500 a month. We also talked about, and you'll see this as the details sort of play out, uh, we also are planning to do, if this is approved and we, we're able to fund this, we're going to do a one-year uh, forgiveness. So if some folks have left us in the last couple, three years, or maybe they want to come back, um, and maybe they were here for 10 years prior to that, we'll forgive that year in between, or two years, or three years, or whatever it was, and give them the, the credit for the time they've spent here in Fauquier County, and add it to that 20 years. We'll do that one-time forgiveness. Perhaps that will entice some people to come back to Fauquier County. Uh, all right, so last, or moving towards the end of this presentation. Uh, workforce investment in the 21-22 plan, per VAS's recommendation, my, in my next biennium budget, 
you'll most likely see a plan where we receive 100% of market. Um, this, this is a way of uh, obviously making us, keeping us competitive, allowing us to retract and retain quality people. Um, and it, it's the right thing to do. Step two, implement policy and practice for any annual step and cost of living adjustment. So not this coming year, but the next year, you'll, my proposed budget will include cost of living increase, excuse me, step increases and a plan to periodically, as many school divisions are beginning to do again, uh, reevaluate the, the, the step system and figure out uh, if there's a cost of living adjustment that's needed. So you have the step increase and potentially a cost of living adjustment within the steps. End of the year planning. This is actually uh, um, an idea that uh, I give credit to Mr. Mr. Mason for. But this is a we, we ought to have a better plan for our carryover funding. So this is the plan. So for carryover funding, this is the plan I would recommend that we follow. The first two being the most important, in my estimation. Every year we have CSA overages. That's just something that we have to pay. And uh, next, uh, to put aside at least 15% towards those loyalty appreciation bonuses that I mentioned. Um, and I would ask the board, if this becomes a you know, policy, that I'd ask the board that includes some uh, flexibility on behalf of the superintendent in case there's a, an emergency. You know, sometimes, see it, in the last several years, sometimes CSA has come in at $800,000 overages, and that's, that would require maybe an adjustment to that, but it was something I'd come to the board with. I wouldn't do it arbitrarily. All right, so as far as uh, expenditures by subject, uh, there it is. Um, our largest expense area, of course, is instruction. It's, I think we're at 74% of our money. So almost 75% goes towards, towards instruction. That's well above what the state requires or the state asks. We're well above that mark. 89% of our money, of our budget, goes towards salary and benefits. And I, I, I have to repeat that because I think there's a, this perception out there that you know there's all this money and uh, you know you got drawers full of hundred dollar bills. All but eleven percent of our money goes to salary and benefits. That leaves eleven percent of our money for transportation, maintenance, school nutrition, custodial, paper, copy machines, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Everything else comes out of that eleven percent unless it's grant money, which we have a lot of, or activity fund money from the schools. All right, now, is, I mentioned the 2.9 million coming out of our budget. Now, this is the part that may make you uh, swallow hard, but uh, I'm gonna go through these briefly with you. Um, we looked at every possible lever that we can pull to come up with revenues to apply towards mm -hmm. salary. And this is, our, this is our list. I'm gonna go through each one of these individually. Uh, first is breakage, 500,000, a little over $500,000 in breakage. That's typically what we take in breakage, and that's, that's the savings from folks who are retiring at the top and replaced by folks near the bottom. Uh, or folks who are for unfilled positions, for example, folks who leave us mid-year, we still have some unfilled positions. That all goes into the breakage pile. That's about where we are every year. We didn't mess with that too much, it's about $500,000. Class size reduction, we are, I am recommending that um, we reduce <coughs> teacher force by eight positions. Now, I wanna comment on this briefly because the way we address this and the way Major, uh, Major got this, this happy job, um, I asked him to contact each of the high middle school principals and just talk to them about, not, not necessarily where they're overstaffed, but where they could comfortably reduce staff and, have, and it, it have minimal impact on class size. That was the directive. And we came up with eight positions, okay? And for the most part, they're already covered through announced retirements or unfilled positions, et cetera. Uh, so there, there's very little impact to class size within that. Um, the next line is uh, partial hiring increase. Now, we received this long and short of this. Within the governor's budget, there's money for five custodians, five uh, counselor, guidance counselor positions, but we really only need to fill three right now. 
So we're going to claim the rest of that, and in, in, within the next year, if we must hire an additional guidance counselor because of enrollment or something, we will. But we receive money for five, but we can, according to state regs, we can hire three and still be okay. So we're going to claim that savings of 150000 uh, I am recommending that there's four administrative position reductions. All four of those are, are handled through um, announced retirements. Those are just positions that we won't fill. Temporary cash CIP reduction. Uh, I'm going to combine these two, CIP and CMP. Um, because we're in this ESCO project, as you know, in the last few years, we've added money to maintenance CIP. We've added money there to help with the backlog. We've entered into this ESCO agreement, or on the, on the almost there with ESCO, which is north of $11 million. What, what I'm recommending is for the next couple of years, we take that $400,000 back that we've added over the last couple of budgets, we take it back, we put it towards salary with the understanding that, one, the ESCO projects are going to be well above that $400,000 threshold. Uh, two, in a couple of years, we'll be coming back to you and asking to replenish that money okay uh, three this five hundred thousand dollars there it is the five hundred thousand dollars there utility reductions for esco that's us catch ca capturing the savings from the esco projects in energy spending and putting it towards those projects that would have been funded through that $450,000, okay? So we don't owe ESCO, the, we don't owe any payment towards the ESCO project for 18 months. Right. We're talking about taking that right. savings and energy, transferring it over into an asset fund, namely the ESCO project, and putting it back into that $450,000 that we're taking out and putting towards salary. Um, let's see, hundred and 92, oh, I don't always forget what that is. What is it? Oh, it's SPED, that's regional. Okay, this is just, uh, we're taking advantage of a, of a, a state um, opportunity. We partnered with Rappahannock County, so we're gonna now have a regional SPED program, and it's just taking advantage of what the state offers. When you have a regional program, uh, you get more money from the state, okay? So what we're doing is we're taking money now from Prince William, which really feels great, that, we, that we've been giving them for the, the, the regional program. Now we have our own regional program, so we're gonna capture that money, okay? And we'll use that money to pay salaries for the folks who are teaching those kids. We're offering them the same programs, the same instruction. Um, it's just we're getting more state money. So we're gonna take advantage of that. And Rappahannock was kind enough to jump in with us. Health, okay, the health costs, 128,000. Um, we have a 5% budgeted increase for health insurance benefits. Uh, we, we, for the first time in my six years here, we're going to request, or I'm requesting that we're going to pass along 20% of that 600 and some odd thousand dollar increase to our health insurance benefits onto employees. That's the tune of $128,000. So that'll be spread on, out amongst our 2,000 employees. I think about 80 or 90% take our benefits. Uh, so there, there will be a, a marginal increase to health insurance benefits for our employees, but uh, very little. So those are our cuts. Those are our expenditures that we're going to, uh, that we've you know, pulled levers to add back into um, salary and benefits. And as I mentioned, none of this is easy. And some of this might make you wince a little bit, but we do have a problem. And as I've said to teachers at, at meetings in their schools, it's not realistic for us to um, keep doing the things we've been doing. It's just not sustainable, especially health insurance increases. Uh, we do have great class sizes, um, but we're, we're just not growing in terms of our, our enrollment. We're staying about the same. So some of these things are gonna hurt a little bit, but I think on the whole, they're not gonna hurt much. Uh, these are, mo this is mostly grant information, uh, fresh, Title 60, et cetera, et cetera. So these, these are revenues, or excuse me, expenditures within these grant programs, and um, it kind of is what it is. Probably all things you're familiar with, FRESH, 6B, the Regional SPED program, which I just mentioned, 
um, school security officers, which isn't a grant, but it's money the county's giving us to hire these school security officers, so we're kind of treating it as a grant, so to speak. Uh, these are the benefits increases I mentioned. Um, the total for the health insurance increase is $641,000. That's budgeted. It could be a little bit north of that. It could be a little south of that. We're winding down the, the end of a uh, RFP process for our health insurance benefits. And so we're, we budgeted 5%. We think it's going to be around 5%, which would be $641,000. And as I mentioned, we'd be passing on 20% of that to, uh, to our employees. Workman's comp, that VACORP rate went up a little bit. Um, that the, VA, the that VRS piece is just a correction um, to a mistake this guy made last year. Right? Okay, thanks. Uh, so that sort of is what it is. All these numbers start running together after a while. Okay, this is this is the cost. The top one is the most important line, of course. So the cost of the 93. 200% market compression for teachers only is 6 million, 6.124 million. And these are the costs of all the other things. Okay, dealing with um, speech language pathologists, um, uh, say, say it louder, psychologists, etc. That's the 2%, and that's the adjustment. Uh, nurses to the BA scale, the cost there is $170,000. Instruction. Uh, Moving its assistance to the 2% plus the adjustments, 179,000 principals and assistant principals, 102 for the 2% plus a 134 market adjustment. Retiree health care benefit, that's a biggie, it's $602,000 to provide that health insurance benefit that I mentioned. Now that's, that has been actualized, so um, it, that number could change somewhat year to year, but probably not much. It's an actuarial looked at our retirement data and uh, you know how many people we have at retirement age, et cetera, et cetera. That's kind of the range, the number they gave us. It, it, we could have a horrible year where 200 people retire. Right? Not likely to happen, but it could happen. And then at that point, we would come back to you the next budget cycle and say, okay, we have this problem. We have to look, we're gonna have to budget for it. But that can happen with anything. Um, the loyalty appreciation, which I mentioned, is $200,000. I think what we would do there is just create, like, ultimately create an asset fund where that money is, stays in a fund so we don't, we don't have to necessarily budget for it every year. It's in an asset fund. And no money for grow your own, something we probably will be looking for in the next planning budget. Uh, these are some, uh, some smaller. Uh, the, the, I mentioned the counselor positions. Okay, that's the cost. That's the five FTEs, but as I mentioned, we're only going to fill three of those, and so we're going to keep two in reserve. Mountain Vista has requested an additional fifty thousand dollars of change. Uh, technology plan: We aren't we aren't funding the technology plan, but we will continue to pay for uh, technology needs through carryover funding. That that's something that will continue. And then the bus lease: So we're going to we're going to stick with our bus lease plan and continue to replace buses. Okay, and uh, I think this might be pretty close to the end. Uh, this, is, this is just kind of a summary of um, the entire budget proposal, which ends up being $161 million, 825. Uh, that, that is it by category. And then the budget counter. That is the budget counter. This is posted online for everyone's convenience. Um, the next big thing coming up, obviously, is your hearing uh, for the school count uh, for my proposed budget. And at this, after I take questions, again, it will, it will become your budget. So I'll stop there. I've talked a lot. Probably the most I've ever talked through a budget presentation. Uh, so I apologize for that. But it's not your typical budget. Uh, it's not your typical budget proposal, and it's not your typical budget year. And you know, the rule from the county has been, you know, in the middle of a biennium, you only make recommendations for additional dollars if you have an emergency. And I feel very strongly that we have an emergency, and I bet a lot of people in this room feel the same way. But we, we've got to deal with this now. I think a, an 8% average pay increase for teachers would be the highest in our region. Um, 
we, we receive more state money, hopefully we will, the governor's budget uh, works out, than we've ever than we've received since I've been superintendent. Um, we're, we're in a good spot, we have an opportunity, we have an election coming up, that never hurts. <laughs> so um, I, I, I just hope that um, you, you are able and willing to, again, look through the same lens I'm looking through, because I really do feel like we've got a problem we need to address and we need to address it seriously.